and away we go. Welcome back to another Getting Salty Experience podcast. We kind of missed you guys. We missed you, ball bags. We didn't see much. you on Monday. It's like a family. It's like a family in here now. We missed the guys, bro. As always, I'm joined by my partner, Lieutenant Ruffy. What up? Producer Pete, aka Proby Pete. Shalom. And also, Shalom. like every night, we are brought to you by GettingSaltyApparel.com, where you can find some really cool clothes like these. Not like well, Ruffy's out of out of uniform tonight. I might have to get Chiefs. Ah, oh, there he goes. Ah. Okay. Getting salty apparel. And uh, for you guys tonight, the word of the day is saddle up. Oh get it up. saddle up. <laughs> All right, Saddle fellas, up. we got a we got a good one for you tonight. All right, we got a legend in his own right, a master at his craft, thirty-seven years total. He put in. He's the voice of Brooklyn. He's known as Dispatcher One Two O. Your pal and mine, Warren Fuchs. Woo! Yes. What's up, Warren? How's it going, brother? 37 years. 37 years. Holy mackerel. The voice of Brooklyn. He hasn't heard much or seen much. And it went real fast. <laughs> how fast? How could, like this? how could it not go so fast working with gentlemen like these two? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Good point. What, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. Year, what, year did you, what year did you become a dispatcher, Warren? Back in the, back well, in the what? I came in in 67. And I came in as a provisional dispatcher right. because they were very uh, they were very short. They didn't have an existing list, so I came in as a provisional along with, uh, like I mentioned, uh, Herb Iser, Joe Higgins, and then uh, in 1969 there was a test, and uh, you know we all took it passed, and then we went from provisional to permanent. And uh, I was assigned to Brooklyn all that time, and uh, uh, the rest is his history, uh, really. You know, so you did the whole time, whole thirty-seven years in Brooklyn. All the yeah, well, I took a couple of little details here and there, but uh, you went you know, slumming. Stuff, but most, you know, ninety-nine percent was in uh, Brooklyn CO. Was that was that your call number the whole time? One twenty was from the get-go, or was it changed? Uh, they 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 had a, a series of numbers. Uh, my first dispatcher number was seven. Then it was 33. Then it was your badge number. 148 was my badge number. Then it went by group number. And oh, then it really? Went so it's changed a lot. Yeah, wow. it changed. You know, enough to confuse everybody, you know. And, uh, you know, and then they started with, they revamped everything. It started at 100, was the senior guy. But there was nobody between 100 and me, so I, I was 120, but I was a senior guy in the city because everybody before me uh, had, you know, retired or, God forbid, passed away. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I had that number until I retired, and then he retired my number. So uh, wow. was, so when you when you were first starting out, like, who was your guy? Who was your mentor? Who, who were you learning from? Well, I was learning – I learned from uh, – uh, a guy by the name of Morris Heidewitt. Morris Heidewitt, if you do, you know, if you Google his name, you're going to see at one point he used to do all the department orders for the job. He had a printing uh, business on the side, but he was a supervisor in Brooklyn, and he lived right down the block from the Brooklyn CO in, the, in Flatbush, and he was a big buff. So they had, he, he put this uh, book together, it was like a buff manual called the Heidewitt fire buff manual and then he used to do all the fire department department orders out of his printing press that he had right off of uh, Flappish Avenue so I was assigned to his group <laughs> and when, when I was first assigned to Brooklyn I worked with firefighters uh, it was half firefighters and half civilian because it was a light duty position for the firefighters and if they oh, wanted shit. yeah a lot of people didn't know that they it, they, they I worked with guys that come out of 214, 249, and 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 uh, some other you know premier houses. I would have liked to do that. I, they must have sent their company to everything. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, at 214, you're available. Yeah, sure. Shit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, 103. We got a box in Coney Island. Take it in. <laughs> I mean, so it was, hell. Pretty you know, it was pretty interesting to have half civilian, half uniform. And then uh, about three years later, it became a union thing. And uh, they gave them other light duty positions. And they just completely civilianized the uh, COs. What? Uh, let me just shut my phone here quick. Oh, that's he's that guy. Come on, I already, I already yeah. had over there. So, <laughs> so when when you first started out, what was was this guy? I mean, I had a couple of questions right off the bat that I want to ask you. When this guy, when you were learning from these guys, were they doing the things that you do, or did you bring that to the next level? Yeah. Like yeah, they, they, they kind of thought. Well, you know, just remember, I was a buff before I went up there, so I was a buff and. 323 starting in 1958 up until you know I came on the job I wanted to be a fireman I think I told you this that yeah that's what I wanted to get at too yeah yeah and you know medical reasons kept me away from that but uh, I became a dispatcher and I said second best and all the guys I worked with they were you know like initially like I said they were firemen and civilians but all the civilians were buffs they were attached to a company and, uh, you know, you don't have that anymore. You don't have a firehouse buff. Right, right, right. right. That day, you know, they, they'd sit at the house, watch, count the boxes, turn the company out, and ride with the rig. But, uh, you know, it, 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 things change. You know, that's uh, you know, all part of the evolution, like I say, you know. So you grew, you grew up in Brooklyn, though, correct? Yeah, I lived in uh, Mill Basin. I lived on the same street 55 years. Uh, after I retired, I moved here to uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and uh, you know, big difference, but that's okay. You know, I'm ready. I was ready for it. And now you got horses over there, and he says, "Saddle up!" <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. Oh, they just gonna want a drink, uh, Warren. That's it. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, saddle up! Saddle up! Oh, another one! Oh, uh, hey! hey. hey. All right, so so he gets on in 19, what, 68, 67, the year before I was, the year before I was born. I don't want to tell you that, Warren, but all right, so you get <laughs> yeah, man. And uh, how different is it back then as far as, you know, how well, you first of all, you know, when I came in, we had bells. Yeah, everybody hears about the bells. Right. And we had bells and, you know, uh, we had running sheets. We didn't have a computer. So, like, things were, uh, you had to have a good memory. So, yeah. They, that shot that you see right there is me on the old radio console. That's probably taken in 1968, 69. Wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's me when I was real skinny. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had to look uh, to the right, right of me, those two towers that you see in the photo, they were the uh, bell tower. So, you know, if a box one, two, three, four came in, you picked up a, a metal plate that had the number one, two, three, four on it put it in, a, in that machine, and it, dispatch, it went out to the firehouses that were assigned to that box. Really? Wow. And, and it you know, rang on the big bell, then the small bell, the primary, secondary. And the companies, you know, when you were in quarters on house watch. They had the to read the bells, right? Yeah, he, he'd write the box number down, look it up on the assignment card. That's look incredible. It up on the front board, 290-103, it was 90 and 3, house goes, uh, first to engine first two truck, whatever, and off you went, you know. Now, in addition to that, if you had a first two phone alarm, we had, and you guys might have heard the story, uh, we had a, a telephone switchboard with all the companies on it. So when you had a first two phone alarm uh, uh, response, we would tip off with three rings on the department phone. So you would, you know, 290-103 were first two, Sheffield Avenue. You put the two jacks in, like the old switchboard you'd see in the, you know, the from the old days, and you'd ring that phone three times. And when it rang in the firehouse, it was three rings, and you knew you were being tipped off for a first to run. Wow, so that, that's, nice. that's how you got that's how you got tipped off. And then after you got the address, okay, and uh, you know you wrote it down on a board. There was no tickets, no you know none of that. Right. They'd yell it out, 480 Sheffield Avenue. And you had to have a good memory, <laughs> you right? Know? Because yeah. Sheffield sounded like Chef Shepherd and the guy. Right, there. right, right, right. You don't want to be going to the wrong spot, that's for yeah, sure. Oh, oh, oh. It could have sounded yeah. like Shitfield too. You know, it depends. <laughs> you know what hey, I'm saying? Speaking yeah. of Warren, 
<laughs> I want I want a shirt for you. World's busiest firehouse. One hundred three. At, at, at two fifty five and one. <laughs> uh, I know that. I know. Two ninety. One hundred three. Two ninety. Where? Where the hell is that? Is that like up in uh, in Tom Riverhead Mark. or something? Oh, it? Smoke, boo. Wow, the smoke. You broke up a little. I said, where? Where is that? Two ninety. One hundred three. Is that like uh, upstate somewhere? Where is that? Yeah, you know, it's like. Oh, uh, yeah. Way upstate, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, as they used to say, 90 and three, you know, Nine. 90 and three. You know, you worked there with Ira Trial, I, I guess. I just know. got, I just uh, got there. He had just left. Yeah. A lot of guys got out right at 9 11. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Ira was pretty friendly with us and he used to say, hey, why, why, we want to go, we want to go. Boxes in freaking Bay Ridge. I'm going to say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Warren, back then, I, I guess. You know, there weren't cell phones, and and basically not everybody had a phone in their house like they do today. So it was majority of pull boxes, or how how would they come yeah. in? Yeah, the majority were pull boxes. A lot of false alarms. Uh, like I said, the first two phone alarms you got tipped off, then we'd send the box out with you know the metal plate, like I said to you. Right. And just the companies on the first alarm would go. Back in the day, it was three and two, not four and two. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, you know. You know, the companies come in, it was, it was, you know, obviously before the 10, the 10 codes, you know, we had, they would just say work and fire, or, you know, we one on one, and then they got the 10 codes in. We had a 1030 at one time, 1030 was a worker, but they didn't give a 1075 until the chief came there, I, you know, it was like, you know. <laughs> A uh, ten thirty was fire out I, one window. They didn't want to give the ten seventy five. Ten thirty was like people pull up and say, "Make it a ten seventy five, You know, so right. yeah, because he wants to get there. But uh, two and two, they would give two and two, right? Because they didn't want it could be a fully involved frame, but they wouldn't uh, give the ten seventy five because they didn't want yeah, the cheap. You know, no, you know, back in the day, you know, they give two and two because they didn't want the deputy, and yeah. the deputy out there if it was in all hands. They'd have six lines in operation or something like that. And he'd never give a second because he didn't want the staff chief. So, yeah, right. You know, right, right. Get it. So it's like, what, uh, what year did they come out with the 10 codes, Warren? About, about when? Oh, geez. Uh, I, I'm going to say uh, it was probably the end of the late 70s, maybe, maybe early 80s. That's a yeah. good question. I, I really yeah, you know, know what? I think you're right because I've, I've been listening to the audio that you sent us. Uh, Warren sent us a bunch of stuff to, to use for tonight. But um, yeah, during during a lot of that, I don't hear any ten codes actually. You you know, very 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 yeah, little. Pretty much plain talk. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I, I, I got to jump around a little. Can I? I got to tell you a quick story about the saddle up. Of so, course. Oh, saddle up. Oh, nice. Yeah. You so, just did it. You did you it know, good. I, and I'm jumping around, but you know, just stop me if you want and change gears. No, 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 do it. Go run. I, I, I did a lot of fire buffing before I became a dispatcher. You know, it was 323, 283 in the 60s. And I knew I couldn't come on the job, so I buffed all busy companies. Then from 283, it was the rescue. And then after the rescue, it became 255 and 157 when they became busier. And both captains were good friends of mine. And I used to pass the house on the way home. That's how I became friendly. But I, the, the saddle up comes into play oh. when when I used to tip that <laughs> And Anything. if it was something that sounded good, oh, I'd say, I'd, I'd select them on a voice line and say, hey, guys, saddle up. So that's how that whole thing started. All right, well, let's get it. You're going to kill and the audience. Applause, <laughs> and, and, you know, then I got in trouble. Couple of times with I got blamed for tipping them before tipping before the companies went hey, all that crazy stuff. So yeah, that would be your that would be your tip off to them that they were they look like they were going to work. You would say saddle yeah. up. Yeah, I wasn't going to have a run. We were doing four thousand runs a year, so I didn't want to go there all the time. But everybody thought they had a big jump by me giving them right, a saddle right, up. Right, 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 right. Well, who? Is they got to jump on everybody. Uh, right, they were in the middle of. Uh, who, what was right. the company that they used to have the issue with the main the main company? Three hundred nine. Is that three hundred nine there that they used to have? A lot of companies had issues, and I got blamed for everything. You know, <laughs> you know. Oh, they tipped them off. He tipped them off. Oh, you know, like uh, whatever. You know, that's that was okay. It was all all playful. But the story I wanted to tell you about the saddle up. So everybody knows. You, you did it, not me. <laughs> Everybody knows the deal with 54 and 4, how to get Broadway play tickets. You know that, right? 
you, you call yeah. up the company if you need a Broadway. They yes. have like, yeah, okay. So I call up, I call up a friend of mine. I said, I need tickets to a show. He says, give me a few dates. And he calls me back. He says, okay, this is the date. Pick the tickets up at the housewife when you come in you know, to see the play. I knock on the door. The kid answers and he says, hi, can I help you? And I said, yeah, Warren Fuse, I'm here to pick up the tickets uh, to whatever the play was. He says, oh, you're the Saddle Up guy. I said, wow. I <laughs> <laughs> Did he give you a front row then? What's that? Did you get front row yeah, then? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, 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 they took, uh, took good care of me, you know. Let me ask you a question, Warren. Uh, like back in the uh, He's done connection. Like today, like uh, you, you more or less know it's a job by the amount of calls. I guess modern day, even before you left, by the yeah. amount of calls that were coming in. So you kind of knew you were going to a job back then. Was it multiple boxes being pulled, or a box and a and a phone call, or what was it that tipped you well, off? You, you, you would have both. You would have. Uh, well, there was one way of knowing that there was always a fire at certain boxes, and the boxes were called double action boxes. You guys probably never heard of it. But the double action boxes were very old fashioned. And what you had to do was open the door. And when you open the door, a bell rang. OK, so when the bell rang, a lot of people thought the box was transmitted, you know, that the fire companies were, were, were going to come. But it really it, it didn't work like that. You opened the box, a bell rang, but you had to pull the box from inside. So, and it actually said to activate the box, you have to activate it inside. So when a double action box was activated, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is people went out of their way to do that. You knew there was something going on. And a lot of those boxes were parts of Flatbush, parts of bed -Stuy. And uh, bed -Stuy back in the day, you know, I mean, I have to tell you guys, you know, Gates Avenue, 214, 111, 235, all those guys were rocking and rolling all the time, you know. At the same time, Brownsville, East New York, and, you know, there were just so many areas in Brooklyn that were bad, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, was, uh, and, and, and to answer your question about, you know, multiple calls, sometimes you get one call and a bunch of boxes. Sometimes you get a bunch of boxes and a bunch of calls. So right. it would vary, you know, really. I was... Uh... I was telling, I, I think I told this story again. I don't remember if, if I told the guys this off the air or on the air, but I was a, I was a kid. It had to be like uh, 93, 94. And I used to stay up all night listening to the radio. And I used to have, I was in Queens, but I used to listen to Queens in Brooklyn because that's where it seemed like, uh, you know, I would always hear a fire. Right. And uh, it, it was definitely you working. And uh, you two, it was 283 and they were, Going, going on a box, and you're like, uh, you know, we're filling out the box, 283, numerous calls, uh, fire in a six-story, uh, you know, uh, people trapped. So he gets on the radio. He's like, yeah, 283, 10-4, you know, uh, we're responding. So all of a sudden you hear him say, 283 to Brooklyn, and you're waiting for, go ahead, 283, 1075, right? He's like, uh, you got a 107 on this box, uh, Warren. We got, uh, we got a bunch of two-story buildings here. And your and your reaction is just like you're talking to me right now. You're like, uh, uh, 283. We're getting we get a lot of calls on this here, man. You better be checking around because uh, we're, we're getting a lot of calls. Six story. He's like, all right, you know what? We'll take a ride around the block. We'll see what. Oh my God, 1075. You know, like I was like, <laughs> ripping through the, you know, to, went to second alarm, third alarm. I think it went to a fifth alarm actually. Uh, right. right, right after that, but yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, a lot of stories like that. You know, you, you get. You know, I always said there was a big difference between. Uh, quality and quantity. You know, you get one one phone call, quality call, very descriptive information, fire in my attic, fire in the bed. I'm looking down the street. I see a building on fire. Probably meant a lot more than a bunch of calls that could turn out to be a, maybe a compact of rubbish or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Did so, you, so, could you so, tell yeah, over but, time? Yeah, I was going to say, could you oh, tell yeah. in somebody's voice? You could tell, right? Like from doing it for so long, you could tell when somebody had it in that voice. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, people are excited, you know, they could be excited if they're looking at a car fire and then uh, they might not be excited if they're reporting a building on fire. You know, it all depends on the individual. I, I'll tell you a funny story. We, we had a, we had a job in Bushwick when I, it was a, like a second alarm and a civilian called up and reported a fire and said, Oh, it's a real big fire. Yeah, we know about it. We know about it. And they said, you better get more help. 
Bring the cavalry. So he knew what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like if they were in the hood, you know, they they knew what they were looking at. You know, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Warren, I wanted to. Uh, you you want to play one of those? Uh, Wait, I, I want to ask you one question first, ahead. bro. I'm going to yeah. put him on the spot. Warren, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm sorry. Uh -uh. So, 37 years in Brooklyn, right? Listening to all the jobs. Take it back now. You, you become a fireman. You don't have the health issues. What company are you going to consistently does the work? Not not your buddies, not your favorite, just fire-wise. Where are you going? Nice. Well, you know, you're talking about Brooklyn, am I correct? Yes, I'd say, uh, well, I, I, obviously, I, I, it's. Uh, I'd say a, a busy house today that does consistent work, 310, 174. Ah, 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 Ruffy says that. Ruffy ah, says that. What about, what about during the 70s, during the war years? Where are you going? During the war years, I mean, yeah, let's face it, it. You know, all the Brownsville, East New York companies, they were knocking them dead. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. But my favorite, if I came on the job in uh, 69, 70, the, the house I wanted to go to was 235. And 235 really? wasn't doing 5,000, 6,000 runs. They were doing 3,500, but they had the most first do work. That, cool. That's what that's what I would want if I came on the job. Run to you work know, ratio. They got the big numbers. I get it. But I, I, get, I, I know the deal. You know, they get a mark from all hands. They could be standing in the street with a dry line, take up the line, and so on and so forth. Right, but I, right. today, I want the, you know, the, the first do guy is the, you know, first do company. And, and likewise with the truck. I, I, you know, for, you know, your fire floor, floor above. I, you know, I, I know the whole deal. And, uh, well, 111 was perfect for that because they had oh, all, they were first due for them. I mean, they were first due for a lot of companies because they had such a great area. They were surrounded by single engines. Absolutely. And then, then you have that, that one box, that 779 box, Myrtle and Broadway. It's called the Truckless Triangle. You ever hear that? <laughs> no. I have heard of that. Well, it's kind of funny because the first five engines, okay, come from single houses. The first due truck is 108. And they're in with 216, and 216 was six Doesn't go there. <laughs> six two on the box. Yeah, it's crazy. Right? That's what they called it, the truck. And just because, you know, based, based on what you said, all the single engines. And that's, right. that's Yeah, but Maryland Broadway's not that far from 216. No. Wow. That, but there's so many first, there's so many single engines right around there that yeah. share that share all the work. You know what I mean? Wow. Especially back then. But 111, even, you know. He's talking about well, her. Yeah, before our time. Huge response. Huge, yeah. Right. Same 57 has the same thing. 103 yeah. has the same thing. Right, exactly. I mean, you'd go from you know, 111, go from Jefferson Street all the way to the other side of Broadway, all the way down by Eastern Parkway. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a ride. You know what it was with them, too, is they were the only bucket, too. So if there was any yeah. tower jobs over there, right, they would always had the buckets, you know, they would go to all of those fires, too. Yeah. So, and uh, Warren, what's the scream team? Somebody's asking in the chat room, what's the scream team? Scream team? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. I don't know. You don't um, know. All right. Bad info. You know I want to uh, I want to start with that that audio, uh, Warren, that we have. It's uh, a pretty busy night in Brooklyn. Um, so it's a couple of minutes, and uh, I think it's worth listening to. So we'll, we're not even going to say anything. I just want to listen to it myself again, because when I heard it the yeah. first time, it was pretty cool. Uh, and then we'll talk about it afterward. You know, just try and remember what was going on. Is this the Atlantic Fire? No, no. This is the first. The, 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 other, first the one. compilation one, right? Yeah, correct. Okay, 10-4. Coming up. Real calm, real calm. First satellite, come right in on the Ecopaca Radio in front of fire building between Blinker and Myrtle, okay? Between Blinker and Myrtle, one satellite. Six, 
five is dying in Brooklyn, Jay. Three five. Yes, is there any way we can get a towel out of one minute and a half between Knickerbocker and Wilson? We got a whole row of face. We're going one way. <laughs> All right, ten four. He's ordering a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Got another 30 seconds. Three, five, two, three, five. Would you all stick me a towel ladder? On minute hand between Wilson and Knickerbocker. Wilson, 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 Wilson,
during the you know middle of the summer, and not too far after the blackout. So I think it was around the same. Mm -hmm. you know, same well, year. those are the pictures that my, is that the Knickerbocker fire you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. So, yes. so Warren, you know those pictures of the of the whole entire uh, exposure to and fully engulfed, melting the the apparatus. My father took all those pictures. He actually wow. he was a he was a fireman who owned a camera store on Knickerbocker, right off oh. of Myrtle, and he went right. there with an old one ten camera, and he took all of those pictures which are published. If you look at all those pictures that are published, it says Richie Kubler. So he went there and took pictures, some of the greatest fire pictures ever, with a little pocket 110 camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yep. That was, uh, I think that was August or July of 77, right after, August, uh, right, right after the blackout. Right after the blackout. It was hot as hell. Right. Yep. Exactly. Right. That's crazy. But, the, you know, they had their hands full. That's all, you know, you get all that craziness with all the other stuff going on. I'll tell you, I, I got to say, I work with great dispatchers, you know. A lot of guys in the in the in the, uh, in the field never got a chance to come up to the CEO and meet the people behind the voice, but uh, I was one of the lucky ones because I, you know, I jumped out there and I became very friendly with so many guys. But once they came up and they they met the guys and saw what we did, uh, you know, I mean, they, we 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 had mutual respect for each other, but you know, it's it's a different ball game. You know, it's. Uh, you know, you, you got you you become the first responder. You pick up the phone. Somebody's screaming, "My kid, my kid!" It, it's it's tick tock. You got to get the box out quick. You got to get the right address. So I, I got to give a you know. I mean, the kids today, they're great kids. You know, they and, and you know, they, you know, it, it, there's great guys that came before me and other guys and you know and Georgie Munch. I have to mention him, uh, Georgie Munch. I, he was in Group Eight. I was in Ten. We, you know, we did what we did and he knew as much as I knew. And we looked at each other. We knew what the other guy was going to do. You know, if he was on a radio and I was on what they call a DD, he knew what my move was going to be. And likewise, the other way. So there know, he is. It's, it's just like as Georgie Munch. He was, a, he was great. You know, like he was a, he did most of the July 4th uh, radio uh, operations. He, he came on after me, obviously, but uh, I did a lot of July 4th before he came in the job. But uh, we used to tease him all the time. He looks a little like ben Benny Hill. I said, eh, there's the Benny Hill show. <laughs> he does a little bit, actually. He, he was great. Georgie's retired. You know, like we were hand in hand and, you know, just that great dispatches. Guys that came before me, guys I worked with, the young kids today, they, It's you just don't have the workload. So what we learned... We learned in six months years ago. It takes them a few years now, you know. So, right, right, right. And then, yeah, same thing in the firehouse. You know the deal. You know, you don't get the work. You know, you, you pull up and things go south. You know, it happens in the CO, happens in the firehouse, you know. Warren, how, when did you start? I mean, everybody knows, uh, who knows you or about you, knows, like, the same kind of story, you know, that, uh, you know, you would get – 135 coming coming to relocate to 120 and you know you'd hear yourself on the radio saying hey uh 135 uh you know where you're going you got to come down uh you know pennsylvania make a right over on easton you know go down two blocks make a left because we didn't have ways and you know guys didn't know everything and and more importantly there were so many boxes going out for fire close to each other sure. but separate that you would have five companies Sure. Two separate five companies run into boxes, and that was your your mo. Like you would say, "Hey, listen, uh, you know, you know, one twenty heads up, one hundred three is going to be coming up, uh, you know, Sheffield or whatever it was." However, it worked out. When did you start doing that? And when did that, you know, did you learn that well, from somebody, or you did that on your own? Well, no, I learned all the streets. They they all tease me about, you know, uh, well, we'll get we get we'll get a street you don't know. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> because, I rode the streets. I used to buff the, you know, I, I, I did a lot of, a lot of picture taking, you know, since I couldn't become a firefighter, I said, let me take the pictures. And then whoever, and Vinny Dunn, uh, real good chief, you know, everybody sees his stuff, uh, all the books he does and everything. Uh, I gave him a lot of my pictures and it was for, for the troops. I wanted him to use my pictures to depict, you know, exactly what was going on at, at a scene. And it was it was like a you know it was for the the benefit of the uh, guys in the firehouse. 
So I, I pull up to a scene and, and take a, a, a bunch of pictures and give it to Vinnie Dunn. And he showed them in his book or video or whatever. And I always remember him <laughs> wanting to pay. He wouldn't take a nickel. I said, it's for, it's for the benefit of the troops in the field. You know, if they can learn something from what my picture shows, uh, it might save it might save one of them someday. So, <clears throat> you know. Uh, hey, Pete, show some of those pictures that we got. We got one uh, I know Warren wanted to talk about. Uh, we got one with uh, Chief Cleehouse. That picture there. What is that there, Warren? You took that picture, correct? Well, that's a, a funny story, and I'll get into it, uh, make a give you a fast version. So I'm working in the Brooklyn CO. And I get the call for that fire, all right? And I look out the window. I said, oh, shit, that, that's a job. I tell the supervisor, I said, I'm, I'm running out to the store. That was the key thing. When I said I was going to the store, <laughs> they, they knew I was going to a job close by. Three blocks away, I get there and, uh, you know, wound up a second alarm. But I, I start taking pictures. And the aide, as you see him on the, uh, on the stick, he's taking the kid from the guy in 132 truck. And the chief is yelling to the aide, 4141 Alpha, get me a second alarm. Well, he's occupied trying to get the kid, kid right? not paying attention to his radio. The chief turns around and goes, Warren, get me a second alarm. So now I become <laughs> the aide. <laughs> and I said to myself, I better disguise my voice. I <laughs> and, pictures, and now oh. I'm just getting a second alarm. It's going to confuse the hell out of everybody. Oh, my God. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> how what did that go to you said it went to uh one more second yeah, a couple of floors but they they you know there's a few more pictures in that series but they you know they made a couple of grabs but that one with the little kid that always got yeah, everybody shot you know. hey pete yeah what's where where was this that's from uh photos by joe sperba uh i can't that's see. chief cleahouse there oh boy wow legend boy oh boy the real deal you got to get Jack on there, boy. <laughs> trying, man. We've been trying. Yeah, Jack. Uh, Jack and I, we go, we go way back to 1968, you know. And uh, you know, and, and the the groups that I rode with and rescued too, were they were called the Magic Kingdom. It was called the Magic Kingdom, and it, Jack Cleahouse was a chauffeur, and John Vigiano was a lieutenant. Wow. And we had Pete Bondi and Lee Ielpi. Ielpi, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! And you had. Uh, you know, Al Steinhardt, he's, it was like unbelievable, you know. And, you know, th those were the good old days. I, uh, you know. Yeah, they I don't think? make them like that anymore, really. Uh, Cleahouse was the real deal. Boy, oh boy. You know, anybody you talk to, you know. Yeah, there's Great. no doubt about that. Big historian, you know, he knows so much stuff. And he's just a great guy, you know, still, you know, all these years, we always keep in touch. And uh, that's, who is that? Uh, that's Jack. Is that Jack? Go back to that, Pete. Let me see. That's Jackamovich, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and who's to his right? That's uh, what's his name? The 270. Uh, that's uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't think of his name either. Uh, what's his name? Uh, I'm Somebody put it up in the, in the text. Uh, what was that for? Where was that? Freddy that's Saparito, somebody said. Saparino, it's Saparino. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy, uh, right. Freddie Saparino, right. He's in the uh, squad 270. 270, now. yeah. Where, where was I, that picture? I couldn't see the picture that well, that's why. Uh, that was in front of the Brooklyn CO. They came up uh, for my last day. My, You know, that was during the afternoon. Obviously. Uh, I got you, I got you. Yeah, there was you know, a whole bunch of companies came by, and then they took pictures in the front. And, you know, uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, a lot of guys. What... Um, what jobs, you know, over the years stick out to you that, you know, when you were working that, uh, you know, you know, every time you think about it, you, 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 you can remember the whole thing. Well, you know, obviously the blackout was a big thing. I, I worked in 1968 when they had the Martin Luther King riots. That was like really, really busy. Uh, I worked uh, some four to 12. We had three platoon system back in the day. You know, now they work 12 hours, you know, seven to seven. But back in the day, it was eight to four, four to 12, 12 to eight. But I always looked to work the four to 12 because it was your busiest. But we had four to 12s, just regular, you know, day, middle, middle of the week. Uh, and uh, things would explode, seven, eight o'clock at night. And 
we go like the hammers of hell. It, uh, it was no rhyme or reason why, you know, just the middle of the week would, would get busy. The cold snaps, that went, went without reason. Any cold snap uh, that uh, was, you know, more than three, four days, you know, you knew the, you know, the, the, the hammered. 1985, I think that was the probably one of the busiest winters uh, for uh, for me as a dispatcher and for the companies. We went, I think it was like just about a month with the high temperature being below freezing for almost 30 days with over 35 or 38 multiples just in one borough. For the wow. Month. And uh, I remember Ray Downey, may rest in peace, he was in a rescue at the time, and that was the first year Rescue 2 moved to uh, Bergen Street. And I remember his, his that they had this big fire on uh, Hall Street, downtown Brooklyn, fifth alarm, and it was like second alarm, third alarm. He, he, his battery went dead, and I threw my radio because I had a handy talkie. And I said, hey, use mine. <laughs> you know, like, you know, they were going from one fire to the other, just like nuts. But... In addition to that, there were uh, regular tours. You went in for four to twelves, and you just got hammered, you know. Ran, and you know, you heard the stories about running out of companies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, any unit in Brooklyn available? Any engine in? I, I remember fires where you know, like three eighteen from Coney Island, going first two. The only one available going first two with the flappers. Wow. Two thirty eight engine from Greenpoint going first two with the like Browns. <laughs> You know, you know the, the old story about garden hose is your best pet. You know, we were just short of telling people, you better get a can or a garden hose, you know, like. <laughs> Running out of companies. That's yeah, incredible. Man. I mean, not just Brooklyn. I mean, Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had half of what we had and, and resources, you know, and not to, not, not to take anything away from Manhattan. I mean, Manhattan was rocking all the boroughs. You know, Queens was busy, a lot of pull boxes. Uh, they just didn't get... The amount now Queens is the borough now would work, obviously the Thirteenth Division gets uh, gets a lot. But back in the day, you know Manhattan, Harlem, Lower East Side, and uh, South Bronx, and all yeah, of you could you know where all the spots were. I mean, it yeah, was just easy all, to pick. All Brooklyn was uh, even Bay Ridge in Brooklyn, or they called it better known as Sunset Park, two hundred one and one fourteen. They were busy in the seventies. They like Tally Hall, right? Yeah. <laughs> They had as many fires as Brownsville companies. That's Coney crazy County. to think that, right? That's crazy. Yeah, Coney Island, the same thing, where all the projects are now. 318, 166, got hammered. Three, four, five years. Then they burned the, all the... All the yeah, projects. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff that was really going on in, in the borough at the time. I mean, was, and you'd run out of companies. You'd get three, four jobs at the same time, and... Me, the busier the better. I, you know, I didn't want to wish anybody's house to burn down, but I just loved the challenge. You know, it was just going in there and doing what you got to do. You know. Yeah, sure. Did you like? Uh, I want to ask you a personal question. Did you like when, if a Queens company was coming over relocating, would you try to send them, or would you try and send a company from Brooklyn? Well, you know them? how it, you know how it works. You know, we got our favorite. <laughs> Oh, I know. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> who came up to the Brooklyn CO with bottles during Christmas time? Uh -huh. we had this, Allegedly. You know, Allegedly. First, you know, and then, uh, you know, I had friends of mine in the field and, uh, you know, Howie Carlson, you know, story with three two and the Carlsons and he was in 120. <laughs> he used to write his own own ticket, you know, and whatever he was working, we always, we relocate him to 105 and then send him to the fire. And, yeah, uh, yeah, right. I, I, that, that's what I was getting at. Like, you could yeah. tell, like, certain times, uh, and, you know. And Punch and myself, you know, we had our favorites, and, uh, you know, we, we took care of what we had to take care of. Well, we always went with, with, with what I was taught when I came in the job. And it was always, we were taught the nearest available goes. So if, if a company was relocating another company, and they had to pass the fire that the first company was at, and the chief comes in, he says, urgent, give me an extra engine. Right, 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 right. I'm going to send the guy that's right there. Right, of course. Firehouse. I right. mean, if you're a chief, you want the company to drop out of the sky. I mean, you don't want to wait three, four, five minutes. Right. I mean, right. With urgent, I'm going to do the right thing. So I kind of like did that a lot. Georgie Munch did a lot. And a few other dispatchers. With the redirection, you know, you're being redirected. We take truck companies off of water leaks and send them to a 
uh, something that sounded good. So we, right, 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 we right, right, right. Like our own thing in Brooklyn and the, and the chiefs, they appreciated it. They, they said, you know what, you know, you're on the radio or Georgie Munch is on the radio. We know we're going to get the help when we need it. So it was good. You know? I think that, I think that's a little bit of what is missing a little bit. Right. I mean, uh, I think because now the regulations and I might be wrong, but it just seems like you could do a little bit more than like now, if you're going on a, you know, an EMS run or a gas leak, which, you know, is 99.999% of the time going to be absolutely nothing. Right. A lot of times they still send you on that box. It don't, I would say that that happens more now than it, you know, back then you would take somebody off a box like that. You yeah, know, and it, and, you know, they got different rules. They, right. you know, you got new, you know, you got new kids in the job and, you know, they, they don't want to take the chance or maybe a new supervisor doesn't want to take a chance. And I get that. Okay. And, uh, you know, like some of the kids, they, they, they try to do like what Munch and I used to do. And, uh, and don't forget, you know, Munch and I, we, we had a team. It was, it was me and him and there were six other people. So we, everybody had to be pretty much on the same page when you're going to make a move because one guy has to know what the other guy had to keep positions with the DD and the radio, but everybody else, we're all part of the team. It's like an engine ladder. You know, you got your, you know, your, your cam man, the irons man, the OV, the roof guy, and everybody's got to do something and you got to depend on each other. So, you know, and, uh, you know, but we did a lot of redirection of companies taking them off from one box to another because we knew the streets and, 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 you know, that's the way we were. We just learned all the streets. We knew the response patterns from company for, for companies when they came from, when they were going from mm -hmm. quarters and you could tell on the set, if they acknowledged the run of quarters, I knew what route the company was going to take pretty much, you know? So that's how you got into a, uh, you're being redirected. And can I bring up one story about rescue too? Of course. Yeah, man. Yeah. Okay, so, it was, uh, you know, uh, John Vigiano was the officer, God rest his soul. And they were uh, coming from Bergen Street. And it was before Rescue 5 was on the on the map. And they were going to Coney Island. And they were going from Cordes to a 1075. And I know that they go to Albany Avenue and, you know, go down by Empire Boulevard. They pass the CO. So anyway, the box, the 1075 is out like three, four minutes. And I know they're on the road, you know, three, four minutes. And we get phone calls on uh, on uh, President Street between Brooklyn and Kingston. And I said to myself, wow, they, they, they should be right around Eastern Parkway. And I said, rescue, what's your location? They were right where I thought they would be. And I redirected them off to 1075 because we started getting phone calls and kids trapped. Well, they got there before 234, 123 because they were right there. OK. And, you know, they had, they had a couple of cans and they did it with a couple of cans, but they made three grabs. Wow. And when they got back to quarters, <clears throat> you know, Vigiano called me up. He said, man, that was like a, a sharp move. Now, whether it's me or somebody else that was on the radio and I tell them to do that or Munch was on the radio, you know, you, 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 you got to you got to know that. You know what I'm saying? So I could have been on what they call the DD and I could have told the radio dispatcher who was brand new. And I could have told them, get rescue to redirect them to the box that you see on your screen. And they do that. And, and you know, and you get it done. You just so like I said, what part of the team? It's no I anything. Well, you know, that's a, I mean, and those kids lived. That's correct. That's a move. It, yeah, I mean, it's it happened more than once, you know, and, and I used to get teased all the time. They used to say, how the hell did you know? Well, you know, you use a little math. And figure out, you know, they, they acknowledge the run. What's it going to take them to get to Eastern Parkway? Box is the other side of Eastern Parkway. So you do the right thing. You just send them. Nearest available. Always remember that. Yeah, but the, the, nearest, the and those nearest kids, available. Listen, those guys were right there. That, that, that extra couple of, you know, two minutes, three minutes, whatever it was for the first new company to get there, that yeah. could have saved, that could have been the difference. Right. Really? But, uh, yeah. yeah. That's no yeah. doubt. And I, that, that was my, that's, I wanted to do the right thing, you know. And I always, you know, when it came to being a heads up catcher, that was that was my mission. You know, like I, I, I never never became a firefighter. If if I did, my mission would be be become the best nozzle man. You control your destiny. You know, and and likewise, being in a in a CO, you know what? You know, I controlled your destiny. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. Uh, hey, Warren, what was your busiest night that you remember ever? 
Well, I gotta say, uh, it's gotta be the blackout. I mean, I was blackout. working. Lights went out. Uh, I was uh, working the whole next day, so that was the day tour. So I worked when the lights went out, and uh, and the, you know the shit hit the fan. And then I I laid down for like two hours, got up and went that whole day tour with, you know, you heard all that 157 only and that little tape there. That's all part yep. of that. So that would be my busiest uh, uh, night tour. I, I you know. It, it, there were so many, you know, I, let, let me tell you this too. So you talk about the blackout of 77 and the blackout of 2003. Now you guys, you were probably still in the firehouse and 2003 was busy, right? Like, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. That was a busy four to 12 in the seventies. And I was there for both. So I, I'm not bullshitting you. I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I like it. The, the 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 blackout in 2003, and I heard it from guys in Tufik. Oh wow, we did you know so many runs, so many old workers. school, right? Old school. That was a busy four to twelve in the good good old 70s, the war years. Period. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> you That's know? great. But uh, so, that is, you know, so you know, I, I guess you want to ask me. I'm jumping around here, so no, I, do I, it. What what else you want to ask? Uh, they're talking about directing them into boxes, bro, because a couple of the guys were saying, you know, like uh, for real locators that Warren would direct them in. He would almost know exactly where they are and say, you know, two blocks up, you know, make a right by the uh, red right. awning. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Funny, you know, it, 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 and I would prompt the companies because a lot of guys, you get a young officer. They don't know. Radio, you, right. you know. It's going south. They don't want to interrupt me. They don't want to ask me for you know direction. So like, if I had like 135 or 140 coming across the line at the Bushwick or whatever, uh, and they were relocating, say somebody in in Bed Stuy or whatever, I'd say to them, you, you, "Do you know how to get there?" <laughs> and then if they get a run, I'd say, "Do you know how to get there?" And what what are you looking at? Uh, uh, well, I'm facing this way. I said, "Okay, make a right, make a left." And, they used to call me up and say, oh, man, oh, man, thanks a million. I didn't need a route card. <laughs> so like, route card. Uh, well, that, that's right. You know what? That's That was another ask. I forgot about that because, you know, <clears> I, <throat> I got into relocating and I got into watch out with the boxes. Right. But when you got relocated, you had to grab the box from that firehouse, right? And I, nobody I know, knew where the hell nothing was. Right. I, I know chauffeurs that if they had a run while they were coming back from another run. Right. They wouldn't know where to go. Right. right. Right, right, exactly, right. Because it was from the firehouse, the, the the directions, right? So you wouldn't know where the hell yeah. you are. Correct. Don't, don't you have a film of Warren waving somebody in? Oh, yeah, that's you right. Do, right? Warren, we actually have a, a film of you directing somebody in. Well, it's check funny it out. because in the lead up to this, Warren gave us a lot of a lot of footage, more than any other guest so far. So this is one of my favorite clips that Warren gave us, and it's of himself. You should be able to see the runway at 300 feet. Aim a touchdown a third of the way along. Slight crossman from the right, so be ready for it. Land too fast, use your emergency brakes. Red handles right in front of you. That doesn't stop you. <laughs> who's, rubbing, who's rubbing you there? <laughs> oh, boy. We lost Kevin. He had to probably go tank. I had to go to the bathroom. What? Uh, yeah, that was freaking. When when we first did this, Warren, we were talking about it. I said, uh, we we got to get that airplane skit, you know, like when he's telling everybody which way to go. You know, he's telling the pilot what to do because that's what you did. I mean, everybody knows you just for that. You know what I mean? But the route cards was. I was I, a tell key you, I I I studied those streets. I rode the streets. I knew what I was talking about. And Georgie Munch, the, the between the two of us, we knew exactly where to send the companies if they needed instructions. So I got a, I got a squad one story that's pretty funny. Ready? Go. Do it. So every time, yeah, I got a bunch of friends of mine that work there, and uh, I stopped in one night, and I walk in the door, and a, one of the guys said, hey, I got this street that you don't know. I said, that's impossible. So they give me the street, and uh, you know, I, I get it right away. So I said, I got one that you don't know. So I give them the street name and they run over to the map. I said, no, no maps. I said, here's the deal. All the surrounding companies are out, 220, 239, 279. 
and I want to use you as an engine, and I'm giving you this address. And I said, I want to tell me where it is. And they all look at each other. So I said, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to Vinny's restaurant for dinner. And I said, and when I come back from Vinny's, I'm stopping off at the house. I expect an answer. You know what they did? They went out and they asked a couple of old time locals where the street was. They found it and they called me at the restaurant. They asked the Fiona. <laughs> Who the hell called me at the restaurant? We got the street and they hung up the phone. <laughs> nice. Who was that, Squad One, you said? Yeah, that was the uh, Squad One. Yeah, it was pretty funny. All right. Hey, Warren, so, you know, I want to ask you a quick question. Yep. You know, we had uh, a La Famina last week, and he and I didn't know this. I, I thought I knew a lot about the squads, but you know, back in the day, he was telling me that um, Squad One only responded to first two boxes and 1075s. Right. They had well, to be going to an enormous amount of work then. Well, here's the funny story, okay? And a lot of people don't know this. Uh, squad One was the only squad that had first two boxes, and then when we sent them. So that meant whether it be on phone calls or whatever. Right. That's a nice gig. <laughs> okay, so they had 36, 37 boxes, first two only. All the other squads had first, second, and third two. So now there's some buzz in Park Slope about them closing a certain firehouse. And there was a big meeting downtown. I shouldn't be saying this, but I'm, I'm retired, so I can get away with it. Screw them. So there was a big meeting downtown. And they said, well, you know, you can close this house. I don't know if it was said exactly like that. If you close them... You got the squad. And, and you know, squad could, uh, you know, they go first, second, third, do So you got them. And somebody turned around and said, no, they only go first, do And it was a bunch of staff chiefs that never knew. It was like the best kept secret. First two boxes. You're like, what? Wait, that, what? <laughs> and that's when it changed. Really? Uh, but in the late 70s, Warren, they late, had to be they had I mean, to be going to a ton of work. First, second, and third do I mean first two boxes and just 1075s, their work to run ratio had to be crazy. Well, squad one came on board uh in 1977. It was uh, December 3rd, 1977. Prior to that, it was an engine company, 269. My wife was born and raised in Park Slope, right in that area. And back in the 70s, the I'm going to tell you real quick, the the uh, brownstones were like $25,000. Park Slope was going downhill. Incredible. And all those companies were doing three, 4,000 runs a year with work. Now you fast forward to, you know, the last 10, 12, 15 years, you're talking about brownstones that... Uh, $5 million. Yeah, yeah, like crazy. And they had a, they had this Con Edison and Brooklyn Union Gas Company. They had like a, a program. You buy a building for a dollar. I think Dennis you, might have mentioned that. You was talking about that. You yeah, buy a building. But you had, you had to renovate it and live in it for three years or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You, you, you buy the building. You got to fix the building. Before you knew it, Fox Slope started slowly but surely coming back. And look at what it is today. Yeah, it's you incredible. Know? What you know? uh, so So that, you know what, now that you say that, so squad two, three, and four were disbanded in 76, and then they opened up a squad in 77? Yeah, well, it's a lengthy story behind that. You know, there's a, a lot of politics involved. I'll leave it at that. And, uh, yeah, hmm. they, they closed. Uh, they, they wanted to bring back an engine company in Park Slope. They did away with 269, but then things were getting, you know, going south, and they wanted to bring an engine. And, I, and I'm going to say it this way, Ray Downey, God bless his soul, he was very instrumental in getting that squad there. I was probably the sole person. And that's how that happened. You know, it was, hmm. you know, politics and... Yeah, 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 of course. And, 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 and the reason why they would do only first do stuff was to keep them in the neighborhood. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. That was one of the reasons right, why... Right, I got you. So they weren't they going started, all so the way out, right? They, yeah, you know, I'm making a case to you know reactivate a company. You come back wow. to the squad, and they kept them in the neighborhood with the 36 first two boxes, and you know, and it was a big workload. So they did go away. You know, uh, they had probably uh, you know, well, they had the whole borough one one point before 252 came on board, and uh, and 288 at the other end. But uh, for the most part, they they had the whole borough for a little while.
know? my, yeah. bo- my boy Viverito is going to be sick when he hears this story. Uh oh, uh oh, the Viv. <laughs> the Viv. Yeah, he knows. See, I know. Yeah. So, uh, um, Mr. Fuchs, quick question for you, if you guys don't mind from the chat. Um, they're wondering how technology, you know, did to did to how did technology affect dispatch over the years? Well, uh, you know, that, I, I'm going to sum it up pretty pretty quick, and 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 we'll do it this way. So back in the day when we had bells and we had to tap out the bells, pull out the assignment cards, and all that stuff, that was a little more time consuming than now. So the big difference now is you get an address, throw it in the computer and release it to a position, which is called the DD. You're talking about getting a call, having it at the DD and being out to the company. And I'm going to say less than a minute. Now, now, granted, you could get busy and you could get a bunch of stuff in what we call the queue, which backs up and you prioritize what you're going to send out before you know, uh, building fire would go before a gas leak, a gas leak would go before a CO detector, stuff like that. So you can kind of like prioritize the runs by yourself at the DD position. But pretty much, if somebody gets an address, excuse me, I'm, <laughs> I'm not drinking, but uh, <laughs> you get an address, you get the cross streets, you send it to the DD, that guy takes a quick look at it, releases it, it's in the firehouse, in, in, in less than a minute. That's how quick they are. And uh, so compare it to the old days. If you had a bunch of boxes come in and you manually had to set up the cards in the machine and everything else, you're talking about some boxes going out uh, minutes later, minutes, three, four, five minutes. Wow. So the fires could, could have a chance to get have, bigger. You, know, you could get a bunch of phone calls and I would turn around and say, hey, that job on uh, that uh, the phone alarm on Grafton Street, Send that out now because that's a job. So there was a way of prioritizing. Right, right, right. The old manual system, but the the new newer system, the computer. Hey, listen, when that came in in 1977, Brooklyn was the first borough to go online with the computer. I was against it because back in the day when you had to do everything manually, you learned a lot more. You learned the companies mm. a lot quicker because you you calling the numbers out. You know, you got the card, you got to write them down on a piece of paper. Now everything's on the screen. So you learned a lot quicker. And, uh, you know, the guys I worked with, they were phenomenal. You, they were all buffs from different houses. Everybody, you know, they they knew the boxes, they knew the streets. And so the, the old days, uh, they, they, it was a learning experience. Now you're dealing with a computer and they, listen, computer's good, you know, and, and that's what you taught on. That's all you know. But uh, I would take that manual method based on my knowledge and a lot of other guys that were really outstanding dispatchers, and then they get those boxes out. They knew how to prioritize. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, nearest available. We did that then. I do it now. I try to tell the kids now, you know, like, uh, let the boss know what you're thinking. If the boss says no, then it's no. But, you know, you, it's got to be nearest available, you know, really. Hey, let me give a quick, uh, brief uh, saddle up. We're uh, first do it, Kerry's box. Nice. <laughs> first do it, Kerry's box. She's My word. My word. So, yeah, so I, you know, I, I became very friendly with 255, 157. Like I said, I knew both captains personally. They invited me in, and uh, it was a great kitchen, great house, the real deal. The tone alert went off. It was, you know, running. running rig and like they were running like they were responding to their mother's house you know, like and uh, just get out of the way it was like what it was like in the 70s you know yeah like, yeah, yeah you know you, eh, that's the way it is you know you get companies that uh, i know 90 and three were quick and uh, you know there's a, a bunch of others in brooklyn and that's the you know that's the way it was and that's what i how i remembered good old lefty and why when i was uh pritchard was there i'm assuming yes right yeah, Jack Pritchard was there, you know, <clears throat> and uh, Charlie McGrath was a captain in the uh, in the truck. His father used to be in 112 Madison Street back in the day. Pritchard, you know, I knew him from being a probie, 283, rescue, the whole nine yards. So, like, they, you know, I used to stop, I used to pass the fires on the way home. And I became real friendly, and uh, guys were great, and I just fell in love with the house. Not to take anything away from anybody else. Every house that I put my that I stepped into, 
you know, they, I'm telling you, one was better than the other. I had a whole bunch of years I rode with Rescue 2. Great guys, real deal, stories. Oh, my God, forget it. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, and then I had, of course, you know, 231 and 120. 120 was, you know, one of my favorites. And, you know, it just, it, they're all, I loved them all. I, and, and I was very visible in the field because between taking pictures and just showing up at a house, and inviting the guys up to the CO right. to see the other end, I became very friendly. So, you know what? It, 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 at the end, my last day, I, it was like unbelievable. The party that I had was like unbelievable. And, you know, it, it, what more can I say? I had a great time. It's, did you so you hated, ride along? You, you hated what you did, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you my, ever ride my, along in uh, Rescue 2 when they were in 210? Yep, I started riding with Rescue 2 in 1970, and my wife bought me my first camera. And uh, they moved from there to Bergen Street in 85. We got a picture of, of 210. Right, let me ask one more question, because I was assigned to 210. Did you, okay. Were you there when uh, – did you ever get a, a dinner made by uh, Nino? Oh, Nino, yeah. Nino. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I Nino. What's you know? that? I still see him. I see him. At the Do you? Yeah, yeah. Nino's. Uh, That's it, Pete. And his. Uh, Which one right here? Back. Oop. Up. Now there's two ten. Yeah, I mean that's that's uh, like that's unbelievable. I mean that's the back of my book, but you you talk about the legends there. Holy jeez, it's like crazy. I mean, you see Joey Downey. Joey Downey is it? You know, oh my God, he's on the left there, all the way yeah. left. And Holy his shit! Duffy, he's not even in the picture because that book was published in '85. So Chucky came in uh, after 85, I guess, it, like maybe a year later or two years later. But his brother's a deputy. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, look at just look at those guys. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, incredible. Mr. That's Mr. Incredible. Fuchs, everybody, everybody in the chat, like I've had about five or six guys already ask, can you please tell us a munch story? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> I think that's for uh, chapter two. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do a whole chapter on the Benny Hill show. Oh, and and now, now you really got to tell us that. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I, I don't. I <laughs> which one out does? Uh, I don't know. Go, go to the next and I'll think as I'm talking to you. All right. All right. So we have, you know, with the stuff you sent me, I wanted to go over the audio of the uh atlantic uh avenue fire so right. uh we we had a long video the video was incredible but it was just too long to right. download so, yeah. so that the people could see it so what we're going to do is we're going to play the audio version uh right. with us okay yeah so we'll we'll listen to it first basically okay. the video was was that the guy was in the in the back seat right he's listening to yes. you you know go through the, the job as it's damping up right he's in a 38 battalion car Right, he's the 1075 chief going, but he Correct. was above riding with the 38. Uh, but that was uh, Eddie Kolduff was the chief. And then oh, after right. we listen to this portion of audio, we'll show everybody the, the box essentially. It was crazy. That was a wild And I just want to I want to tell you a little of what led up to that whole night. And I think you, I told you Lou, a little about it, but I think you want to do it. We'll do it before or after. What do you want to do? We'll do it before. Let's let, let's all right. Go ahead, set it up. Okay, so that particular night. Uh, I get a uh, I get a phone call from uh, Timmy Stackpole, God rest his soul, and Timmy was in 103 at the time, and he knew one he knew 120 truck was out of service, so he called me up. He goes, "Why, why? You got to get me a job tonight. 120's out. Send us on everything." That's the way Timmy was, and I, you know, I talk to him a little, and I hang up. Now I'm obviously on the radio, and I hang up with him, and in the door of the Brooklyn CEO walks Father John Delendick, the current fire department chaplain for Brooklyn and Queens. And he was a big buff, and he heard me on the radio, and he, he said, oh, I thought I'd stop by and just, you know, hang out with you. A good spot, you know, you're in a Brooklyn CEO, you could hear everything first. He's a buff, he could buff it on his own, whatever. He's sitting down probably five minutes, and that box goes out. So you had Timmy that I got off the phone with that almost got killed there. Right, right? he got burned. And yeah, Father right. John, who's the fire department chaplain sitting next to me when I announced the box. You talk about 
I got goosebumps just yeah, telling man. you. Yeah. You know, it was just very spooky, you know. And, uh, you know, and then poor Timmy, you know. He, uh, so he that's, how, that's how 103 was there at that box. I always kind of wondered that, how, how they, they were in there. Up because ah, we, you know, I didn't even know that. 103, yeah. A lot of people didn't know that. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, and then I, I knew it was, you know, Timmy, because I got a couple of phone calls from from guys that said, you know, he's pretty messed up. And, and uh, you know, and obviously, uh, you, you know, the rest. Yeah, between, yeah, yeah. Coming back after two and a half years of rehab and incredible, you can't even make I'm, it up. I'm very friendly with Tara, and you know, right. So we used to go to all the masses after poor Timmy got killed, and, and uh, yeah, it just you know, like a, a lot of memories, you know, set. All right, so we'll, we'll what we'll do is we'll listen to the audio first, and then it'll roll into the spot where Pete will show the actual building as the as the battalion, the the, the 1075 chief pulls up. You could just see that the building is absolutely ripping, and you right. could tell it's going bad. And um, you know, we'll, we'll just listen to it and just see how you handle the whole thing. Right. Go ahead, Pete. Brooklyn, the second alarm has been transmitted for box 2044. 
the flyers on Atlantic Avenue near Hinsdale Street. I repeat, in the borough of Brooklyn, a second alarm has been transmitted. The box number 2044. The flyers on Atlantic Avenue, and that's on the south side. That's near Hinsdale Street. That's my orders of uh, the chief of the 4th Ball Battalion. Dispatcher 120 in Brooklyn at 2033. Division 1 Message in Brooklyn. Division 1 1 Messenger, okay? You can you send a raise, mate? Uh, not at the present time, okay? Division 1 1 Message in Brooklyn, sir. Uh, After the message of Henry, he's on for the uh, 28th, Alex, and uh, Randolph. All right, uh, I think that's what we gave him before. You're going, you're going to that uh, fire scene, right, uh, Messenger Van? Yeah. Oh, what are the cross streets? That's Varick Avenue and Randolph Street. That's up by 206's quarters. And for the right, you're steady. And for the Brooklyn. And for the Brooklyn. Box 2044. We have a three story frame, 20 by 75. So is your one street. Similar size, exposure three is a yard, exposure four is a one-story garage. Uh, we have a heavy fire initial, having trouble getting uh, the hose lines to the fire. We have people on the uh, upper floors, purchase room progress, fire is down for cash. And where is the fire located at the present time? We're having trouble locating the fire. Alright, thanks for them. Be advised, uh, 3-9 Battalion will be the communications coordinator. Yeah, the 3-9 will be the communications coordinator. Call in Division 1-5, okay? 1-5, uh, uh, just be advised, uh, 176 is the fast truck he has been notified. 3-9 Battalion is the communications coordinator at this time, okay? 1-5, And also, there is no uh, rescue. The rescue is still operating at uh, 288 bucks. Okay. Units responding to the uh, second alarm box 2044. Be advised, that's the south side of Atlantic Avenue. Calling Battalion 39. 39, K. You are the communications coordinator, and be advised, there is no field calm, okay? Uh, and for Division 1-1, Division 1-1, okay. We'll be responding to the second alarm. Okay, 10-4, we'll assign them. This is where it starts going a little shitty, I think. All right. So we're going to talk at this point. So we could show the audience this um, uh, when we get Warren back. But, yeah. All right, so you have the video? Yeah. We're, we're right there? All right, you can play it now. You can start it now. He's back. There he is. All right, so we're going to go into the video really quickly just to show everybody how intense this situation was. 39K. You are the communications coordinator and be advised there is no field calm, okay? And for Division 1-1, okay? Okay, 10 4, we'll assign them. Dispatch 120 at 2036. He is now responding, correct. But be advised, he's probably going to be a little delayed, though. He's coming from up north, okay? Dispatcher 120 in Brooklyn at uh, 2036. Division 1-5, okay? Okay, are you ready to write, Chief? Okay, you're uh, receiving... Well, first of all, they, they had an... Call your message, go ahead. Fox 2044, transmit the third alarm, okay? All right, uh, 10 four. In Brooklyn, the third alarm has been transmitted for Box 2044. 
drives on Atlantic Avenue on the south side. That's near Hinsdale Street. Third alarm transmitted, Brooklyn Box 2044. South side of Atlantic Avenue and Hinsdale Street. And uh, units should be advised, it's a uh, three-story frame. And the 44 initially reported uh, people possibly trapped on the floors above. Uh, calling Division 1, 5, okay? Calling Division 1, 5, okay? Calling uh, Division 1, 5, okay? Some wow. crazy stuff, man. Yeah. Listening to that whole thing and then watching it. Yeah, got chills, you know. Yeah, I, I do this. You know, I remember I was working that night right there at the end of that video. You hear 288 is coming yeah. on the frequency, and uh, we uh, we were listening to it on the handy talkie. And you could, you know, obviously the collapse had happened, I'm assuming, right when he gave the third alarm, right? You see some guys running, yeah. you did your report. And as you already know, they had the other job up at uh, that by 206's quarters. So Rescue 4 was originally coming to the Brooklyn fire. And then when 2 became available, my boss said, return 4. I said, no, let them both go in because I, I you could hear, I mean, there was stuff going on. Let them, you know, and they both went in, you know. Yeah, man. But did, were you able to, did, did, that's what I wanted to ask you when I first thought about this. Did, were you listening to to the DARS or whatever? And, and could well, you hear what was going on? Have, we didn't have DARS back Back then, we had uh, the Handy Talkie channel. We'd be able to pick up probably three quarters of the borough just by selecting it because we had the big antenna, and uh, you know we we could we uh, numerous times we knew what was what what report we were going to get from uh, Chief's aide before he gave it. Right, before. right, right, right. We I, I used to listen to it all the time. You know, I just wanted the heads up. You know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> And and I knew stuff was going south. You, you know, was in rocket science. You know, you could you could you could just tell by their voice that. And, and Chief Galvin was in the four four, and I'm saying you know like let both rescues go in, and you know, so just very sad night. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually I actually was. Uh, I I said this. Uh, I think uh, I don't know who we talked about it with. Oh, with uh, Chief Lafamina, that you know. A lot of guys started showing up to 332 because uh, uh, well, it was Lapidra and Blackmore, but he was uh, in 332, and I'm not sure which one was in 332, uh, but his but, shoes, Blackmore. Blackmore. So his shoes were his shoes were there, 
And I remember, you know, people started coming into the firehouse, obviously, when, when you know, an hour, two hours, three hours after the job. And uh, I remember looking at his shoes, you know, like, like, holy yeah. shit, man, you know, like, uh, and, uh, you know, listening to the job on the handy talkie when we just came on the air. So it that's when everything was really, it was only a few minutes after the, after the collapse. And uh, it was it was terrifying to listen to, you know, even as a fireman, you listen to that. You could tell, like you said, guys' voices just amp up so high and so much, uh, you know. Yeah, But exactly. uh, tough, tough night, no doubt about it. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I, I was on the radio when Louis Valentino got killed, you know. So, you know, you, sometimes you, you, you're there and, you know, it, it seems like a routine job and it's yeah. – not routine anymore. You know? How was it for you, Warren, when, uh, you know, especially you're talking about Timmy Stackpole, he survived, and against all odds, he had the will to come back only right. to die on 9-11, which is, you know. Yeah. Like crazy. And that was, that was only, he only just came back, like, I just think it was less than a just, week. Yeah, yep. I, I think his first tour was in 105 truck. I was working. He was first tour as captain in 105. I sent him a teleprinter message. To Captain Jobs, you know, Timmy Jobs. Yeah, was, Timmy Jobs. And uh, and uh, when when 9-11 happened, uh, you know, I went to the house. It, well, I think it was Donnie Haid called me and said they found his remains. And it was early into the uh, recovery. And uh, I went to the house. And Tara said to me, she said, i got to show you this. And. She said, Timmy loved you, and she showed me the teleprinter message that was in his attache case at the time, and uh, in the car, they, they found that message I sent to him. Huh. Yeah, yeah I, I got goosebumps. I love Timmy, you know, you know just a terrible thing, you know. Where did you, 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 you used to see him in Rescue too? I'm assuming, is that right? Well, I, or? I lived on my block, too. So, oh, shit, I didn't know that. Oh, holy yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, Timmy lived on, uh, not for a long time, when him and Tara first got married. Uh, I, I'm going to say they lived there a couple of years. But he installed the air conditioners in my house. And I knew him from 147, rescued to, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then they moved to Marine Park. And, uh, you know, I, but I was very friendly. I, I was talking to Timmy probably three, four times a week, you know. Wow. But, Crazy. Uh, yeah, you know, it was just uh, any that guy loved the job. You know, you were oh, talking about a guy who loved the job. Loved Holy the shit, to fight job. back, to come back, you know, incredible he, he man. Worked so hard. I used to see him when I used to run, when I used to run myself in uh, Marine Park, and I'd be Sick. coming around. And, wow, wow, how you doing? I'm coming back. I said, oh, man. When I went up to the burn center and saw his legs, I said, if he comes back, it'll be a miracle, and it was a miracle. You know. Only, only to be uh, not only a miracle, but he worked really hard to get back, which shows you how much he loved the job, bro. You know, because any anybody else would have checked out, but he tried. Yeah, very. You know. uh, he wrote. He wrote something really touching in uh, in two ninety one oh three's his la the last journal there. You know, yeah. I think it was, you know, not too too long before that. You know, nine eleven, and uh, it's like a whole page, you know, for everything that they did for that for him and the family and everything. And, uh, you know, very, very touching guy. You could tell, like, for a tough guy, you know, he really cared about, uh, you know, he cared about the guys over there. They loved him over he, there, you know. Uh, very religious. They were very religious. You know, he did the pre caners for, you know, uh, newly weds to be, if I could say it that way. And uh, he always wanted them uh, retreats and very, you know, just a, 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 an unbelievable human being. I guess that's the best way of saying it. And... Uh, it was an honor and a privilege to know him all those years, you know, all those years. And then poor Timmy got killed. And Saddle yeah. up for Timmy. Saddle up for Timmy and right I, here, kid. I've <laughs> <laughs> missed one of them, you know, we were there until they didn't, you know, she just didn't have it anymore. And But, you know, I always remember Timmy. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, let, let let's uh, get a little lighten joyous now. Yeah, let's lighten it up a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, obviously, we you know well, we want to well, respect those guys. I got a Rod I got a Rogers Avenue fire story. Yeah, you now you're kicking. Now okay, you're cooking. Well, so this is back in '92. 
before you had direct deposit and all that stuff, I was, it was a Thursday night because I was going into the Brooklyn CO to pick up uh, my paycheck. And I was right at the junction. Some of you guys know what a junction is in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. Uh huh. And the uh, box goes out for Rogers Avenue and Clarendon Road. And I said, oh, shit. Right. I'm right here. A couple of phone calls. Before I get to Rogers Avenue, two, I could see 255, 157 ahead of me. And, uh, you know, they give a 1075 and you can't see the street. I'm like four <laughs> blocks away. <from> the- <laughs> <laughs> so it was a. Love it. it. Like a tool, plumbing and tool. Oh, I'm out on that. I'm out on plumbing supply places. Yeah, so this this smoke is coming out of the building square, like, you know. And I'm saying, and Freddie Gallagher was the chief in the 4-1. So I get there and I said, oh, shit, this, this is not going to be a, a simple all hands. And a propane tank lets go in the rear of the building. And it blows two companies clear across the street, right? <laughs> Now, Freddie Gallagher sees me, and his aide is one of the guys blown across the street. And he wants, you know, Freddie Gallagher wants a second alarm. And he sees me. He says, give me a second alarm. I get, I get on the uh, 4-1 radio, and I said, you know, 4-1 urgent, transmit a second alarm. So now, and he says, you tell him what you want. He says, just get, get towel ladders. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, there's a spare, spare radio in the car. So I grab it. And I said, Chief, I got the spare radio, blah, blah, blah. And, and he's telling me all these progress reports. So I wound up giving the third extra towel ladders. I moved the car because you couldn't see where the, there was so much smoke <laughs> in the gas station. And I figured that's where the towers are going to set up. So I said, Chief, I'm going to move the car because they're not going to see the rig. <laughs> you know. That's crazy. Anyway, so it winds up, uh, the, the funny part of the story is, thank God, all the guys were good. Uh, you know, minor injuries and, and, you know, and it winds up a fourth alarm. But the, the funny part of, the part of the story is the all hands chief, everything happened so quick. So now the all hands chief comes in and the aide is looking for the aide in the four one. Now he doesn't know me and I don't know. <laughs> him. He doesn't know that the aide is laying across the street. I see where this is going. He instantly became the aide. So he says to me, he says, what do you got? I handed him the clipboard. I said, you got it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you okay? Yeah. You, you seem to get involved. uh, You, you, you at the right time there when you show up there, it's not, that's not too bad. You know, Well, I, I I will say, and I hate to bring it up, but the day of nine 11, I I went there from my house and uh, parked my car on West street. And it was before the first tower came. And I was looking for Ray Downey because he always, if there was something crazy going on and he saw me, he'd throw me a radio and he'd say, Hey, you know, do this. Do this. He always, even when I was in the rescue, you know, like he, he, he had a lot of respect for dispatches and he had a lot of respect for me. And he always, you know, like I said, he gave me something to do. Well, I parked my car and uh, it's like unbelievable. I was looking for him. I never made it there, and I never made it there, and that's what saved my life. Wow. Holy shit. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, had you yeah. found them, you would have been standing right next to them. I yeah. would have got it. And, and the first tower came down, and my, my boss, uh, Steve Gregory, he's got three boys on the job. Uh, you know, I, I went down, I guess it was uh, uh, whatever, VC Street, and Steve Gregory saw me, and he says, Hey, wah. And I said, what do you need, boss? He said, got to find out where the next command post was. And it was after the first building came down. And that was my only radio transmission on, I think it was 202 engines rig. I just grabbed the radio. You know, everything was destroyed. And and then uh, the rest is history. You know, the other tower came down and yeah. everybody teamed up and did whatever. They didn't know right. nobody where to start. And and uh, I, I'm well, I, didn't know, I didn't know that part. I didn't know that. That's uh, you know. Yeah, I was every- going to ask you if, you if you were on the radio that day. So I guess that sums it up right there, man. You weren't. You were there. Yeah, the end. You know. Yeah. Trying to, uh, you know. How's your health? How are you doing? You got any issues? Yeah, any I, love- uh, I mean, I go for stuff, and thank God. But uh, you know, we're right around that mark where guys are getting more and more. So. Yeah, it's every week. Every week. Yeah, so, you know. Make sure you get yourself checked out, man. Yeah, you know, I went back there 
quite a few days, you know, hooked up with Dennis Oberg and, and uh, Lee ILP and Yeah, Lee you know, was there. I mean, I say that all the time. I know and, every time I was there, he was there. Yeah. And Vidge, you know. And, Vidge, Geidel, uh, yeah. you know, all of those, those uh, you know, old timers were all there looking for their sons and stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. searching, searching uh, for their kids, really, you know. So, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I knew a lot of guys. I lost, you know, and I'm going to say it this way, 60 friends. Yeah, no guy. doubt. You know, and I, I'm not just, oh, how you doing? You don't talk to them for six, eight months. Oh, no, you know these guys very well. Oh, got guys that, uh, you know, I went to their weddings, you know, kids' confirmations or whatever. You know, it's uh, I had that closeness. So, you know, I was going to wakes and funerals and memorials, me and my wife, and it was like some of them were like, Two, three a day, you know. It was pretty messed up, to say the least. Warren, the guys want to know where you're living today. Where are you? They they, they see your castle back behind you. They want to know where you're living. <laughs> I live in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And for anybody that's familiar with New Hope, Peddler's Village in that area, that's where I am. I'm tucked away in the land of make-believe. It's, uh, you know, it's different, but it's okay, you know. Where do you go for a good slice of pizza over there, bro? I mean, what do you <laughs> He goes to Staten Island. That's where he goes. Well, I Brooklyn. Ask those is if I want to tie him. I was just. I was gonna, you know, I give the kid a tip, and you know, that's it. I was going to say he drove when I was talking to him last week. He's like, uh, I said, yeah, just uh, if you email me the, the pictures and the, and the, video, the audios and stuff, you know. He's like, nah, I'm come. I got to go to Staten Island anyway because I can't get any good uh, mozzarella and uh, you know brisket up here. I got to take a ride down to Staten Island. He says, I'll just go over to Long Beach. I'll drop everything off to the kid over there. At least, you know, I, I know you would say mozzarella the right way, but when we first moved there, funny story, away from the fire stuff, get people laughing. So we go to an Italian restaurant, make believe Italian restaurant, and I and I tell <laughs> the girl I want calamari. So she says, Where's that on the menu? And I point. <laughs> she says, Oh, calamari. <laughs> I said, Calamari. I said, well, who, the, who the hell is she? <laughs> you mean a fresh mutz. You know, well, he's, a, he's the guy we're going to have on in a few weeks. Calamari, right, bro? Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, John. oh, that's what he wanted me to tell you. He said, when you got, uh, because we're going to actually, uh, when we when we close out tonight, uh, we're going to close out with your last call uh, as a dispatcher on the right. air. And uh, the squid said to me, uh, he texted me, he said, make sure you tell uh, tell Warren that when they presented, you know, they took in the the run, allegedly, and allegedly, uh, allegedly and uh, they gave you the bell, right? He said a bell or yeah. something, a, a, a bell. And yeah. it said from 120 to 120. 120, yeah. Very, very, very nice. Yeah, I have it downstairs, but, you know, those top shelves. I, I loved all the guys, you know, like, you, you know, uh, how can I say it uh, any better? You know, they, they were all great. I had a great career. They were all great to me. I, I, I did the best I could do for them. I, you know, if I could sneak them into a fire or got them out of a relocation. And that just me. <laughs> I love it. Well, again, it was, it was a team effort. You know, everybody knew the deal and they knew that I was very, you know, I, that I was a big buff and I was always in a firehouse. So like, uh, you know, uh, nah, man, you can so tell good. that it's easy so to good. see that. It's easy to see that that you love it. You know, and I still, you know, I still to this day I go to. I was just in one fifty seven the other day in two fifty five, and after I left Peter's house, uh, I stopped there on the way back, and uh, you know, just to say hello, and then, then I had to run home. I was going to stop at Squad One and the rescue, but uh, I ran a little late. What's uh is is well, I don't know how to say his last name is Galan still in fifty five? Oh, John Galan, yeah, John Galan. Is he still do Galan? Is he still yeah. doing that shit? He's out of his mind. Great, great. he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love him. Tough. Yeah, he's a tough he's guy. Been, man. He's been there. I'm gonna say it's fifteen oh, years, right? 15, 15, 17 years. Yeah, because I was at two ninety when you know we used to kind of work, yeah. kind of for each other because nobody else wanted to work there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, real, real good guy. Oh, they're all great, you know. Yeah. And you know what? Every firehouse, whether it was busy or quiet, and they turned out fast. They turned. They were all great guys. I, I, I you know, I made my mark with them, and uh, I was always, you know, always welcome to every firehouse that I went. Is Vic to. there and still? That, Crazy Vic. What's that? Is Spadaro still there? Yeah, he's still there. Yeah. Maniac. 
Yeah. Hey, hey uh, Warren, have you seen Rescue 2's new quarters yet? Yeah, I've, I've been there uh, a couple of times already. Something else, huh? Isn't it amazing? <laughs> kind of crazy. You know, it's not your, you know, obviously not your typical. But, you know, it's the same thing with Rescue 3's quarters. I've right. been up there to see Tannis and, and the guys and stuff. And I get I get around. You know, when they say you could come up to the Bronx, I say, where's that? You know, like. Uh. <laughs> the mainland, right? The mainland. Yeah, the mainland, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, the borough of uh, tall buildings and short stories. Oh. <laughs> and is, uh, and there the was <laughs> short story, right? Short building. Dollhouse City. I know all that. Stuff. Ah, I love it. <laughs> is there anything, uh, Warren? Before we close out, is there anything else? Uh, any stories that you wanted to touch on, or, or you know? No. I, I, the one thing I, I'd like to say, uh, you know, uh, Sal Casano and I were. were very good friends, and still to this day, what what he did the day after I retired will always be remembered. And I don't know if Sal's listening, maybe his son's listening, but he may be an honorary battalion chief. Oh, right wow. Retired. And to be an honorary battalion chief, you know, there's a little more to, you know, the, just the chief calling up and saying he was the chief of department then. And it was a little more too. Well, I recommend this guy go through a procedure. But he called me up and he said, "I want you to be an honorary battalion chief." And I, I said to him, "I said, Sal, I, you know, I'm not into that stuff." He said, "It's from me to you." I said, "Say no more." And I thought, and to, still to this day, that's great. I, I, I think of that as uh, something that was very, very nicely done. And, uh, you know, I just want to cherry on top, man. That's the cherry on top of a career that's uh, yeah, you know, never thought of it. Foot off and, the, uh, career. My, my boss, uh, Steve Gregory, you know, he's got three kids, and they're, they're, yeah, they're, we all know. not kids anymore, you know, but he retired my dispatcher number. So, I, I mean, wow, you know, wow, that's uh, pretty cool. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, like, uh, a lot of things, uh, very nicely done, very appreciated, and, uh, you know, what. All the guys that are listening out there, you know, I got a, a lot of guys that I'm friends with in so many different departments all over the planet. And I'm sure there's a lot listening. And and uh, all I can say is thank you to all. It was a great run. I'm out 16 years, but I, uh, wow. I never oh, forgot. Oh, shit. Wow. Holy shit. I just remember hearing you on the radio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Man, so, so, Pete, is, is it that time, Pete? Oh, that's right. Oh, it's that you time. mean it's time for the old school tip of the day. All right. So I, I asked Warren before we started, I'm like, you know, listen, you know, what if you want to do it, you're in. If you don't, it's fine. He said he wanted to just give a little something. So, uh, Warren, shoot it, man. Well, you know, I, I say it to everybody and to all the dispatchers out there that might be listening. It's very simple. Just make a difference. And love your job. And I know so many out there that are listening. And they, these kids are great. They're the future. A lot of them are going to move on and become firefighters. I worked with a lot of guys that uh, worked with, you know, they were dispatchers with me. There's a bunch of chiefs out there now. So, you know what? When they were in the job as dispatchers, they made a difference. And as chiefs and company officers, they're still making a difference. So, you know what? That's what. That's the key thing. Make a difference, and people remember you. Buddy. And uh, you know, love your job like I did. You know, truth. <clears throat> Warren, saddle up, kid. Saddle up, baby. So, Pete, we went do in person. That's right. He met that Pete was, in person. That was that's cool, fun. man. Yeah, yeah. When you when you brought by, I mean, just for everyone listening, Warren brought by stacks, stacks of DVDs and CDs of all these images, and then I had to like convert everything and make sure Louis got his hands on it, so he picked some of the best stuff. And uh, for sure, I think we did, man. And but we still have I mean, one more thing. Stuff, you know, but you know, we got one more thing. We got to uh, before we say goodbye, we're gonna let Warren say goodbye the way he did on his last tour. Shoot it, Pete. Stand by. December 28th, 
This is Warren Fuchs, Dispatcher 120's last radio transmission. I would like to thank each and every member of this department, both past and present, including the dispatchers, firefighters, chiefs, commissioners, and other personnel, as well as my family and friends for sharing part of my 37 years of memories. I'd also like to thank my son, Chris, whom I had the opportunity to work with in Brooklyn for two years, for also being part of this journey. To all the friends I lost on 9-11, I miss you terribly. I'd like to conclude by saying there is no greater love than the love I have for the New York City Fire Department. Till we all meet again, God bless you all, and thanks for the memories. Dispatcher 120 in Brooklyn. Over. Seven answer me. And that could go on. He said amazing. it was amazing. 100 after that. It just never stopped. It was perfect, man. A great time.
do, do I have another? Can I just say another couple of? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Go ahead. So real quick, you know, I did 37 years, but in our job as a civilian dispatcher, uh, there's no mandatory retirement at 65 like you guys have to go. So we can, I could still be there. Right? I mean, really. So I left because I always said they took my home away and all the COs were closed and they combined them. Right, the right, 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 right. Public answering building. Uh, public, right. Public answering centers is a better way of saying it. PSAC buildings. Right. So I knew that was that Brooklyn CEO was closing. I said to my wife, I'm not going downtown. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, everybody in a fishbowl. It wasn't my my thing. So uh, and that, that that's why I left. One of the reasons why I left. So uh, and, uh, you know, we have a guy currently in the job as a dispatcher assigned to the field com. I got to give a shout out. Billy Liddell, I know he's listening. He's got 50 <laughs> years in the job. No shit, man. Holy shit. And then I always tease him. And I say, Billy, if I had stayed, I, I'd be going on 52. <laughs> yeah. what, what's his number, Warren? What, what, his, where is number, he? his dispatcher number would be 100. And where is okay. he? Where is he working? He works in the field com. And, uh, oh, all right. I got you. you. Know, obviously, he's a senior manager. He doesn't work in a CO. I got, I got you. I got you. I got you. Listen, when you get 50 years, yeah. you get to pick the primo spot, right? <laughs> but I had to give a shout out to him because he's a trooper. You know? Yeah, cool, man. Very cool. That was uh, I, when I first saw those videos, I told Pete and Kev, I said, we got to put that as the last thing because even myself, you know, watching it, you know, I hear those guys, you know, oh, since since you. I hear, you know, when, when they uh, dispatchers retire, you know, guys do do that, you know. But, uh, you know, to see the person doing it on the yeah. video and watching, you know, your response to it is different than just hearing it. You know, you could tell. But when you get Herbie eyes, you'll get some. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you got to get you got to get me. You got to you got to hook you me know, up. Herbie eyes, there's, there's quite a few guys. <laughs> All right. You're, whether you're a guy crawling awesome. down the hall or a guy on the other side of the mic. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no oh, doubt. Man, yeah. You know, I work with great guys, and you work with great nozzle men, and you know, yeah, yeah, I, no doubt. We'll get them. You know, we we have them on both ends. You know. Yeah, you said it. You said it well, man. You said it's all teamwork, man. Everybody has his <laughs> job. Yep, no doubt. You know, nice. You know, it's nice to be able to tell some of the story. <clears> but <throat> I was just part of that team. I, you know, I was very lucky and. I say it all the time. I work for the greatest fire department, greatest fire department on this planet, bar none, period. You know? Awesome. Amen. Sure. Amen. You know, really. Amen. So, yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you. I don't regret any day, you know. Every day was uh, uh, just a, you created a memory, you know, really. Yep. Warren, I want to thank you for coming on, Warren. Great show. Yeah. Great, great show. Awesome. Pleasure and meeting you all and uh you know i'll give you some names to uh i'm sure we're through. talking all the time yeah man we're gonna get some more guys on here so uh that's gonna wrap this one up pete and uh louis yeah, well all i can say is dispatcher 120 over and out <laughs> nice <laughs> well you you guys all know where you found us tonight but if you're listening to this we can find us at youtube.com forward slash getting salty experience and while you're there please do us a favor get your little digit out and give us the finger just like that Come like on, subscribe share Thanks, Warren. <laughs> there you go like subscribe and share guys that's the big secret to making this thing go way bigger so we can come visit you. Um, find out all the last minute up to the second information of what's going on with the channel uh, on our Instagram account at Salty Dog Inc. And of course, if you want cool guy shirts and hats and cigar cutters and lighters and all the accoutrement that you need to uh, do whatever. Salty the hell you do <laughs> go to www.gettingsaltyapparel.com and guys just uh because everyone keeps asking what the email to the show is um the email to the show for our q a's and everything like that is getting salty experience at gmail.com awesome. all right boys good awesome right. stuff once, once we start, hey, help me 
stay healthy. Well, hold on, Warren. Right. Once we sign off, we're going to be in the back, so uh, don't sign off just yet. Oh, okay, good. All right. Yeah. All right, fellas. Until we see you guys on uh, Monday night, right? What do we got? A Q and A yeah, Monday night. We're going to try and figure out. We, we're kind of up in the air. We're kind of this week uh, with the other uh, Chief Steve uh, episode on Monday. It kind of pushed us back a little bit, but we'll figure everything out, and I'll I'll throw it on the Instagram for them. All right. Until we see you guys again, like I said, we actually missed you guys. This is like one big family now, and it's growing and growing. And we're going to take this stuff on the road soon to come see you guys. Until we see you the next time, stay low and go. All right, brothers. We'll see you at the big one.